welcome you on this beautiful afternoon. As you can see, I've kind of cut down on the numbers. It always does when we do events like this, and it's nice and bright and mm -hmm. sunny out. But we are so privileged to be able to do this exhibition. About two years ago, Mimi approached me and asked me if I would be interested. And I had never been to Flying Horse Farms. And I went up, and of course, I was immediately, well, Laura went up and Chet, the staff, we all went up, and it was so impressive. The enthusiasm, the commitment, the dedication of the staff, the enthusiasm of the children. It was really a wonderful experience. So we came back, we very carefully looked over our artists, and we selected the ones mainly from Ohio, but there are some from New York and Colorado. And we decided which ones to pick for this exhibition. And if they couldn't get here, most of them went to the farm. But if they couldn't get to the farm, we sent them packets of material. And every one of the 17 said, yes, they want to be a part of it. And I was so proud of them, too. So they went up and visited the farm, many of them. Mark Bush, who's the young artist who did the portraits, was there. Karen's been to the farm, uh, Karen Snoffer. So it was really Paul Hamilton. It was a wonderful experience for all of us. And so I'll let Mimi take over from here, but I wanted to know, Mimi know, that how grateful we were to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Marlena. Um, we can't thank Ham and Harkins and Marlena and Laura and everybody enough um, to see camp represented in so many different ways here. Um, it's just amazing for all of us. Um, almost everybody sitting here is familiar with Flying Horse Farms, but there's a few of you that I haven't met. So l let me give you a brief overview of who and what we are. Um, Flying Horse <laughs> Farms is a camp for children with serious illnesses. We serve children between the ages of eight to 15 and some precocious seven-year-olds. <laughs> we'll make a few exceptions. Um, and they come to camp for a week at a time and have the opportunity to do what they should be doing, which is to be kids, to have fun. Um, in the words of Paul Newman, who started the first camp um, as part of the Serious Fun Children's Network, they raise a little help, but not Madeline. She, she's always well-behaved. <laughs> um, but what happens at camp is really um, transformation. What happens in this gallery is actually transformations. Um, the kids come to us oftentimes and families come to us oftentimes unsure of us, um, unsure of what to expect, um, but by the second day at camp um, they're really focused on what's important and that is being a family together and having fun. Um, we do three different kinds of camps. We do Family camp weekends in the spring and the fall, so the whole family gets the opportunity to come to camp and experience the joy of camp as a family. We do sibling camp weekend weeks, and that's for the healthy brothers and sisters who sometimes take a back seat to the child with a serious illness, and they get an opportunity to come to camp and also find joy and realize that they're not the only one in that circumstance. And then the core of what we do is residential camp. Um, we serve children with all forms of heart disease. Many of our campers have had heart transplants at their young age. We serve children with all forms of pediatric cancer, with severe asthma, gastrointestinal disease, um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, kidney disease, and we're starting our first craniofacial camp. So it's a chance for those kids to come to camp and feel a sense of a new normal. And I will tell you, the experience of the artists coming to camp um, over the last two summers was just remarkable. I mean, to have two hours with Amina Robinson as she's on a golf cart and stops you and says, oh, look at that stick. And I'm thinking, that's a beautiful stick. Um, and, and it was. Um, and to have Karen come to camp and Mark um, and to see what they've done for them to embody camp in a way that every single artist here that's represented really got what we do at camp. I mean, you can see it in the portraits, you can see it in, in these, I don't know what the word for them is, Scepter. scepters. Um, you can see it in Amina's quilt. Um, Paul Hamilton captured 
our boathouse and the lake and the wetlands, every single artist caught the inspiration of camp, which is really about finding joy, happiness, and fun. Um, and so I'm gonna hand it to Erica to talk a little bit about what it's like from a family experience um, to be at camp. I'll be brief, because I'm not usually able to be brief, but I'm gonna try. <clears throat> my name is Erica Decker, and my daughter Lily Decker is currently 10 years old. Um, to date, she has endured over 100 rounds of chemotherapy, uh, major brain surgery, two port placements. But if you look at that picture right behind you, that's what she looks like every day to me. And that's because of camp. Um, when she was four, she was diagnosed with a brain tumor, inoperable. Um, so that was terrible. Um, and then it was stable for two years, and then it doubled in size when she was six, and we started invasive chemo uh, chemotherapy, um, which was horrific. And we were, as a family, at our lowest that we could ever be and couldn't see a way out of that. Um, but there was a friend of mine that kept calling me and she had been on the tours before Flying Horse Farms had opened and kept encouraging me to look into Flying Horse Farms. You really need to go check out what they're going to do. They're not open yet, but it's about to be and it's really this amazing place for kids. And, and uh, I said, okay, thanks. And I would, <laughs> I would hang up and not think about it again. And she would keep calling and you really should check it out. I really think Lily would love it up there. And as a mom with a six-year-old with an active brain tumor who is in the middle of chemotherapy, um, and you're just fearing for their existence at that point, sending them to camp is almost on the bottom of the list, uh, especially to, when you look at them and wonder how many minutes you have. And then you think about sending them off to a camp. Well, you know, there, she was going through lots of blood transfusions. She was uh, inpatient hospitalized lots of times for fevers. And, you know, commonly chemotherapy, uh, cancer doesn't really do as much damage as chemotherapy. It's the infections that the kids really get sick from. And um, to, to think about not having her two inches from me was horrifying. And the biggest factor that I finally realized after I did sign her up for camp because my friend wouldn't stop was I, by signing that paperwork, had to admit that Lily had a serious illness. I had to admit it on paper to the rest of the world that this wasn't going away, that this wasn't something that was just going to fix itself. And this was going to be her label, our label, forever. And that is, that's a, a really defeating feeling um, as a parent. Um, but, I did sign her up, and I went there, and I remember driving into the driveway. It was just Lily and I for family camp. <laughs> and we turned the corner in the driveway, and there were two people in tutus waving madly up and down and jumping. And Lily said, what's wrong with them? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. <laughs> so we pulled up, and uh, they welcomed us to camp, and we drove down the long drive, and we went in the dining hall to register. And when we walked in, there were rows of people clapping and screaming her name. And we, it was so overwhelming because we'd lived in such a quiet, dark place for so long. And then there are these people screaming and with excitement, like she just won something at the Olympics. And our first reaction was to flinch and duck because it was <laughs> so loud and so crazy. And that was it. Then she smiled and she never stopped. Um, th that's camp. Camp can undo all that. And she, the first summer camp that she went to, she was eight months into that invasive chemotherapy and I sent her there for a week by herself. And as I drove away, I thought I'm either the worst mother in the world <laughs> or the best. And I will see how this plays, but I didn't talk to her for a whole week. I didn't hear, a camp would call and say she was fine. Oh my God, she was so happy when she got home. And I didn't realize either what she had also been missing all those years after diagnosis was independence. She had none. We were hovering. We were staring at her. We were constantly asking her, how do you feel? Do you have a headache? Are you hot? Taking her temperature. And I can't imagine how annoying that is, you know, because she just wanted to be a kid. And these kids who have these severe illnesses, 
that must just be so tiring to be dealt with that way. And I didn't realize that she never got to be a kid that got to ride her bike around the neighborhood and, and do whatever she wanted. But at camp, they do. And they have the medical staff there that's in place to handle any situation way better than I could. And um, when I picked her up, she was a different person. She was a completely different child. And we were different people too. That was the first amount of respite I'd had since she was four. And uh, a minute to breathe and, and not be overwhelmed every minute with what's happening. And we finished chemo and she was happy. And the next summer she went back and she wasn't in chemo. She was stable and happy and her head full of hair. And uh, as soon as we got to camp and got her registered, she looked at me and she said, you can go. <laughs> and you know, that's what camp does for her. She is so comfortable there and so happy. Um, it's this place where the illness doesn't exist. But if it does, they can handle it. And not in a way that I would, in an overbearing way. In a really happy, fun way. Where the doctors wear tutus and, I mean, they, and they have wigs on and they, they make it fun. Uh, she did uh, a one weekend camp by herself and she was not feeling well the whole weekend. And she, Barb, Dr. Barb would call me and say, she's sick, she's throwing up, she doesn't have a fever. And I would talk to Lily and she'd say, can I just stay? <laughs> and so she called me all weekend from the, the med medical facility. Mm -hmm. And then she called at 11 one night and she said, Mom, we have another bed in here. Do you want to come up here? <laughs> <laughs> but she loves it that much that even when she felt sick, she didn't want to come home. So she watched the world go by out the glass windows <laughs> and the medical. And I thought, well, okay, I guess. But the other thing that camp provides, and, and I don't know if everybody realizes, uh, is, is the respite for parents as well. Not that it's about us, but in order to be happy people for our kids, we need a break too. And so I started the tradition, as soon as Lily goes to oncology camp, I go out of town. I take myself on vacation. No husband, no nothing. And uh, oh my God, it's awesome. Because everybody gets to recharge. It's like my flying horse. It's, you know, this... It's the independence from the disease, and uh, and we know we have that. The miraculous thing, though, that ha ha the biggest part of the experience from a parent's perspective for Flying Horse, though, is um, that it's it doesn't end there at, at the last day at camp at pickup. It that's just the beginning. They have been a whole new arm of the operation <laughs> at our house. It's um, they're in contact. I can call them. I can email. There's texting. There's hey, they're just this whole new part of this happy unit of uh, what I call soul repair for Lily. You know, I head up the team of research <laughs> and, you know, doctors and specialists all over the country working on Lily's case, but right here in Mount Gilead is the head of soul repair operations. You know, they, and, and that's what she needs because she's 10 and, she, you know, she doesn't, need to be a part of what I'm doing late at night, uh, but she needs what they're doing as much as possible. So uh, we are forever changed as a family. Uh, we're forever changed as parents. Um, she's forever changed as a child with a brain tumor. And I really couldn't tell you where we'd be without Flying Horse. I hate to think about it because um, I can't imagine it, but I'm glad we don't have to. As a parent of a child with a brain tumor. That first night I went home, it was so quiet. It's the first time I'd been without her since she was born, really, um, because she was diagnosed at four. And you know, before that, they, they're with you. And uh, uh, my brain wouldn't let me stop thinking, this is what this house would be like if she didn't make it. She loved it. She had a blast. <laughs> she was so ready to get away from us. <laughs> You've not but if, really. I don't blame her. I mean, looking back, oh my gosh, how daunting that would be. You know, to, oh, here comes she's a thermometer again. And oh, <laughs> you know, the questions. They're kids. Kids, kids. You know, and that's all she's ever known is being held down and poked and surgeries and uh, you know, constant, constant medical care. Um, and they know something's wrong. They see it in our faces. And, you know, I remember my husband asked me, 
this was in the beginning when we were still looking for the right doctors and trying to find the right first steps. And uh, I, I was angry and mad and sad all the time. We all were. And I said, how long are you going to be mad? And I thought, oh my God, he's right. My anger isn't going to fix her tumor. And I looked at her and she's this little child wanting to have fun. And uh, we stopped being mad forever. That time. I mean, that was it. Uh, but, you know, she just wanted to be a kid. And you don't realize the children are watching you because you're their only model in life on how to do this thing. And uh, if you're always sad, they worry about you. And uh, she would always ask, you happy, mommy? You happy? <laughs> and uh, we can really say we are now. I mean, crazy happy. So the first time was last summer? No, the first time was when camp opened in Four 2010. Yeah, she, that's, she's like a professional camper now. Yeah, this, she and Maddie, Madeline, they're, they're yeah. cabin mates, and um, they are mischievous, um, both. Um, and I think what happens at camp and why camp is so special is that we don't ask them how they are. We ne I don't think I've ever asked Madeline how you, I ask, are you having fun? Yeah. Do you like bacon? Did you get enough bacon? Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> all about the bacon. It's all about right. the bacon. Um, but it's a, it, it is a chance to be kids. A kid. And to go boating and fishing and swimming and arts and crafts. and Whatever they want to do. Whatever they want to do. Um, you know, when mom and dad leave, now there's parents in here, so I have to be careful, but... Oh, I hope it's when, crazy. <laughs> it's just, you know, when mom and dad leave, it's, it's, it is controlled chaos, but it is, um, it's intentional programming now. It may not seem like it, but it's very intentional programming so that at the end of the camp, there's not that sense of isolation and there's friendships that are created. And, you know, I remember the first summer... Um, you know, one of our campers, and it was not Madeline or Lily, came through, and um, we were, you know, we were doing passing out brownies for dessert, and the camper came by and said, "I said, you know, do you want a brownie?" And he said, "Well, my dad said I shouldn't have so many sweets, and I need to be careful." And I, Dad's not here. Looked, looked around and I said, "I don't see your dad." <laughs> we know every camper's allergies, so we right. do know that. So there's no question about that. But it is that sense of independence and that sense of freedom. Right. And when you see family camp weekends, I mean, that first that first night, um, you know, it's some it's there's reticence, right? You know, everybody's kind of checking it out. And by the end of by the end of um, the time at the amphitheater, and the, everybody's singing, everybody's singing well, the repeat. Oh yeah, there's lots songs. of singing and dancing, um, and it just changes everybody. Yeah, I, and wouldn't you say that it's almost a hundred percent the first time any of these kids have been away from home by themselves. Mm -hmm. And some of them come really late to the game. They don't go to sleepovers because we worry. They don't go here. They don't go to summer camp like other kids They because they can't. They don't qualify. And uh, But this is finally a camp, horrifically, that they get to attend because they have a serious illness, a life-threatening illness. And that's not an invitation anyone's looking for, um, but to know that it's out there. Uh, once you can get over that hurdle of the admission, that this is where my child belongs. Um, and I have to be honest, a lot of what held me back in the beginning too was I really, in my mind, if you think about it, you know, you think you're taking your child to a camp full of feeble, super ill, sad kids, and it was nothing like that. I couldn't have been more wrong. I mean, from the second you get there, they're all kids that just want to be kids, and they just want to be happy. And even at the family weekends, I can hardly tell anymore the sibling kids from the patient kids. They're just kids having a blast. And now I think, hey, this is pretty cool that she gets to go to this camp, and well, kids don't. You know, this is like her thing, and she feels ownership there. Um, but yeah, this was her first shot at independence which is sad, but awesome. And now we let her go all the time. She's in treatment right now. She's, we only have four more weeks of 52 weeks of chemo. And uh, I know, and uh, I let her head down the street on her bike now all the time. And I think, you know, the, the worst has happened. She was diagnosed with a brain tumor. She's endured over a hundred rounds of chemotherapy. Uh, letting her ride around the block on her bike hardly an issue but before camp I would have never let that happen I would have
clung to hard and uh, she would have been a different child. She wouldn't grow up to be independent and insane and active and uh, thank God for camp. I really appreciate you doing this. What an inspiration. So now we're going to introduce two really special artists who became a part of this project. One is Karen Snopper, who is a professor at Kenyon College. She is a professor of fine arts. She teaches painting. And of course, you all know Paul Newman went to Kenyon. And the other is young Mark Bush. And he did the, Karen did the uh, scepters. And we'll, she'll tell you what inspired that. Mark did the portraits of the kids at camp. And he will also explain what inspired him. So, hi everybody. Um, I first want to, well, first of all, as, as Marlena said, I teach at Kenyon College and um, I've had a, a connection with um, him and Harpins for about three years. And I just want to thank them. I want to thank Marlena and um, Chet and Laura and Chris um, because they've been so supportive of, of me and um, I see them as very caring and professional gallery people. Um, they, I feel like they see us as, you know, sensitive people in the world who interpret, you know, whatever's going on around us, um, and they appreciate our differences. So for th for them to ask me to do this today, I was really flattered, and I did go to the um, farm, and I, there were no people there other than the, the staff, so that was kind of interesting. I don't know if that was true of the other artists. Um, and I got to meet the Belfords at, at the opening, and I'm so impressed with their generosity that they decided to start this uh, camp and acquire this land. Um, and then I got to meet Mimi at the opening, and I could just feel from all these people that I got to meet, the staff that I, the day that I went there, and then Don Wiggins took me around for two hours. Um, he was just delightful. He had lots of anecdotes um, about the kids, and I'll, I'll share some of those with you in a minute. But I first heard of the um, camp because, as I said, I teach at Kenyon College, and an alum uh, who went to Kenyon, obviously, um, and has been a, a wonderful donor for the arts at Kenyon. And actually, we have a new art building that's named after um, he and his wife, uh, Francie Bishop Good and David Horvitz. Um, they got to know Paul Newman. And now David is one of the directors of the Serious Fun Children Network. And I'm friends with, with them. I don't see them often, maybe once a year. But they mentioned to me, or he mentioned to me, that he was on this board. And then there was just sort of, you just sort of hear about things like Paul Newman this, Paul Newman that. Um, uh, and that he had uh, opened, he was, I don't think he was even, I don't think he was alive. He, had he, he passed? He came to camp before construction ever started. Before, right. Um, so anyhow, that's how I knew of it. And then when I went there, I just was obviously blown away, as everyone else is talking about here, um, both the exterior spaces and the interior spaces. You know, it's, it's 200 acres and with all these incredible buildings. So one of the interiors, well, I, w I went into the barn, the sort of like where the staff is, and I believe there are apartments in there in the, up in the hayloft, and it's this enormous structure that had been moved, apparently, by the Amish. And it's just really um, mind-blowing, the structure, and how inviting it is, even though it's quite large and open. Um, and then we went to the Wellnest building, which is, I guess, you know, the medical center. And I was so taken by these individual rooms that Abercrombie and Fitch had gone in and done these really delightful wall drawings, paintings, murals, and I do wall drawings. and. These are so cool, I want to do one of these. Um, you know, like um, images of animals and insects, and each room had a different theme. And then the story of the tutus that um, Don shared with me that when children are 
you know, in the, the well nest with the doctors and the nurses, they'll play some game, and then if the doctor loses, he or she has to wear a tutu all week with a wig. And just, you know, these kinds of stories were just, you know, delightful. He also, of course, we were riding on a golf course, and I mean a golf cart, and, um, you know, I was very taken by the exterior spaces, um, the vastness of nature, and he was telling, we went down the trails, back to the lake, and back to the, the rope course, um, back to these beautiful teepees that had been built for the kids to sleep in with these ramps in case the kids needed um, a way to get up to the teepees because they're elevated slightly. Um, but then he told me this uh, story, this anecdote about one night a counselor was walking back with a little girl, I believe she was eight years old, and she looked up and it was dark at the sky and she said, what's that? Well, she had never seen the night sky. And I just, that, that just blew me away. And he said she was from the inner city of Pittsburgh, um, and a, you know, an ill child, and she had always probably lived and living in some kind of an apartment, or he didn't go into a lot of detail, but I think it blew me away because I live out, I'm, I live in a rural area next to a cornfield, and one of the most magical experiences for me is going out at night and especially in the summer and fireflies are all around and then you look up and the stars are above. It's just unbelievable all these sources of light. Um, so anyhow I, I reflected on you know after that going there on what I was going to say today and even you know the artwork and um, I was thinking about having um, had a lot of connections with children because I, I have a, a um, bachelor's degree in art education. I taught in the public, public schools in Columbus. I was an art teacher. Um, I did a lot of substituting. Also, I was a nurse one day. I was a gym teacher. <laughs> I was everything because I needed a job. Um, but then, like I said, I, 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 did, some, um, I did some teaching of uh, art classes for children. Um, I worked, I've worked with preschool children, and then I got my master's degree, and I've worked with college-level students. I've even wor I've worked with adults. Um, so art is very much, you know, it's part of my life, obviously, but I've also had a lot of like, wonderful experiences with children. And, um, oh, I was also at Ohio Arts Council. I did residencies where I would go to schools in different parts of Ohio who probably didn't have, where they didn't have an art teacher, and we would do projects anywhere from a week to a month. And one of the schools I went to in Lima, Ohio, was a school specifically for children with disabilities. Um, I was told the children who were there had um, IQs of 70 or lower, so they were mental and physical disabilities, and we did an art project for two weeks and we created an installation called Ignited and Excited. And these kids came in and we just, um, I mean, I could spend a lot of time telling you what we did, but it was a really valuable experience for me to be working with, with these children and seeing how excited they were about being creative. So what I wanna um, talk about is how I feel I, I have a lot of alignment in terms of how I exist as, a, as an artist, how I function as an artist and a person um, with the values that the Flying Horse Farms has. I went through the, the list of values on their website and um, the, there are four areas that I sort of came up with. One is play, one is creativity, one is connecting, and the last one is healing. So as an artist, I believe strongly in play. Um, when I teach, I tell my children, or my classes, my students, that we're in here to work, but we're gonna have serious fun. And I use that phrase, and that is the name of the organization that um, Flying Horse Farms is connected with. So I'll say, okay, you guys, we're gonna have fun in here. This is serious fun. And I like the word that you use, with, I think you said controlled chaos. Um, so when I see students playing and um, taking risks and 
having a real sense of abandonment and accessing their imaginations, I feel like there's something going on, an energy that's going on that's magical. And I actually tell my drawing students, I say, we're doing something that's magic here. We have no machines, you know, brain, eye, hand, that's it. <laughs> um, and so when we play, um, and not take ourselves too seriously, because life can be very serious. Mm -hmm. But it's, I feel like it's natural to children, and I even want my older students and myself as an adult to remember how valuable play is. I mean, we all know when we're playful how that can just be such a release for us. And sometimes we forget that we're mm -hmm. not playing. So definitely, you know, it at Flying Horse Farms, these, these kids are playing, and I believe in play in my work. Um, creativity, you know, it's essential to being an artist, and if we're playing, we're being creative. And I'm sure that all the, the young campers, you know, not only are they, say, going to, is it called Angie's house, where they have the arts and crafts, working with materials, but when they, you know, they try things new, they're, they're accessing a creative part of themselves. Um, and they're even probably being creative in their relationships with other campers and their counselors. And the counselors have to be creative, right? And the doctors, we're all trying to come up with how do we, how do we work together, play together in a creative and exciting way um, that's stimulating and, and, and pleasurable for everybody. Um, and then I also feel that when we're creative, we can also be, like I said, be creative with our relationships, like campers with one another, doctors with the campers. But you can also, then you're, you're making connections. And I'm a strong believer in making connections. So even though I'm in my, my studio a lot of hours, all of us are as artists, you can become incredibly isolated. I um, am actually energized by being with other people. So, you know, I isolate myself, I create, I go out, and I connect. And that whole idea of connection, of course, is essential to Flying Horse Farms. Um, and even just my meeting the people who are involved in it, I felt like I was making a connection with um, people who are dedicated to, to something in their lives, and I understand what that feels like. So the whole idea of connecting, and even as they say in their list of values, like respecting one another and being kind, and I talk about that with my students, I feel like in our connecting we are giving back. And artists have such a gift, you know, of talent and knowledge that they can share with others, not just with an object, but also with them, you know, themselves as people, as creative people. And then, um, finally, by, I, I feel that with, by we, when we play, when we're creative, and when we make connections, there's a healing that's going on. And I have no doubts that that's what's happening at the camp. Um, so, Yes, a, a child can, um, let's say, be at home and, and do some play games or maybe interact with family members. But when you, you leave and you make these connections, and especially a connection with nature, and that's what I'm doing here with my work. I, I use objects, materials that I find in nature or even imagery, and I manipulate it, and I feel like you know I'm really making something magical. And so for these three pieces, I didn't make them specifically as a reaction to my visit because I had already been working on these scepters. But um, because they're tree trunks and I see them as symbols of power, you know, that's what a scepter is. I, I was making scepters probably 20, 25 years ago and I came back to it recently. And the reason I call them scepters is because I was very interested in goddesses and how these objects, these staff, the staff, this object is a symbol of power. So I was working on these and you know, just sort of very intuitively adding objects. And after I got done, I, you know, I had to, to title them. 
So this one on the left is called waiting. The one in the middle is called um, roots of hope, roots of hopefulness. And then the one on the end is called bloom. So I see these representing anticipation, hope, and joy. And I feel that that is, those are uh, emotions that, that exist at the farm or at the, at the camp. And so I, I felt like when I was there, I could sense that, that energy and the, those kinds of um, very positive kinds of uh, feelings. Even though I, there weren't any children there, I, just from the stories and the spaces, I could feel it. Um, I'm going to see if there's anything else I need to say. Yeah, I think that's about it. And I just want to thank you for listening to all of my philosophizing. Um, more than anything, I just think this connection with children is so special. And I'm just thrilled that I am seeing some children here today. <laughs> so thank you. Hello. <laughs> Uh, my name is Mark, and I did the two black and white portraits that are behind everyone. Um, a little bit about kind of the process of how we got from the initial stages to those. Uh, Marlena actually asked me about doing the show for Flying Horse Farms, which I hadn't heard about Flying Horse Farms before we started doing the, the research and everything to go up to the camps and visit and everything like that. And then I went up when there were no campers as well, so I saw the camp when there was just, you know, the barns and the, the landscape and everything that was up there without all the energy and everything that's there when the kids are there. But um, a little bit about my process when I first start thinking about, so they tell me about the show and how we're gonna do the show about you know the kids at this camp and everything. And I, I just right away I start thinking, okay, well I do portraits, so I'm gonna be doing portraits of the kids. And then I start thinking, well, well it's kids that have illnesses and I've never done anything that deals with something that's that heavy and that kind of, you know, and I started getting all these ideas of how am I going to show that in these portraits and not make it too dark and not make it, you know, about that aspect of it. And then I thought, well, I probably shouldn't do that. That's a really bad idea. <laughs> so you throw that out the window and you're like, all right, let's focus on what the camp's about. So after doing the research about, you know, Flying Horse Farms is about letting the kids be kids. It's about going out and having a summer camp that's not unlike any other summer camp. It's a summer camp for kids. It's just they have the addition of, in case, there's that, which is really nice. So it gives them the advantage of, you know, like you were saying earlier with the parents, you don't have to worry about that part of it, so then they get to be kids. So then I realized, okay, well, I'm just going to make portraits of kids, which is difficult, too, because you're just doing, you know, you want something a little bit more than just a picture of somebody. So... I go up to the camp and I'm looking around and everything and as soon as I get to the camp I realize it's not about the illnesses at all. There's nothing about that here whatsoever to focus on the fun aspect of, you know, which once you get to that point you can run with that and it's like, well, that's fun. So, excuse me, we, uh, toward the entire farm and we start looking at all the things and there's a big obstacle course in the back. And as soon as I see this big obstacle course, I right away I know, okay, this is what I'm going to do. We're going to have big smiles. We're going to have bright skies in the background. It's going to be super positive. And these are the most positive images I've ever made in my life as a painter. <laughs> For sure. Like, the most positive things I've ever done. Which is great, because that's how I saw the camp. So it really, it did show, you know, how I felt about my whole experience and everything. And I feel like it kind of captured how the kids feel about it, too, which is the most important part. So... Fast forward to when we go, when the, the kids are actually there. So I was nervous about this, because I'm not a photographer, I'm a painter. So the sketching medium that I use is the photograph, though. So I go up and I take the pictures of the kids. And I was nervous because I didn't really know, like I knew who the kids were that I was taking the pictures of, but I didn't know what I wanted them to do for the pictures. So the picture of Natalia on the right, it was really funny because I could tell she was excited about doing the photograph, but she was more excited about doing what she was doing at the camp. So they were doing dog training. So they're running around like uh, the dog shows on TV where they run through the tubes and they jump through the hoops and all that kind of stuff. They're teaching the kids how to do this. And they're all super excited and everything. And I had to pull her away from doing that to do these photographs 
And she was nice about it, but she didn't like that I was pulling her away from doing, you know, all these fun things that she's doing with her friends. And I actually felt bad that I was keeping her from having fun with her friends. So I made it short, and we did, you know, just a pretty straightforward. Um, I like that we had the fence in the background, so you can see it's kind of like a, I don't want to say a barnyard, really, but it's, you know, you get the outside aspect of it and everything. But uh, she was really great, and not once, I mean, after I learned why she was at the farm, like her side of the illness that she faced and everything, why she was at the farm, I couldn't believe that she was just so excited and just didn't care that I was there. She just wanted to go have fun. And uh, so that was really nice to meet her and everything. And then I think I actually did her photograph before the two, the double portrait, I'm pretty sure. So then I go up to do the double portrait, which I don't usually do double portraits, so that was kind of daunting too as an artist to do something I'm not usually used to doing. Because I have a hard enough time posing one person, let alone getting two people to do something interesting. So uh, we started doing the pictures, and and the same thing again. Like it was easy to just let them do what they wanted to do, because I was trying to capture the fun aspect of it and the aspect of you know kids will be kids and that kind of thing. And that's why we titled it Mischief and Memories because kids need to be a little mischievous. They need to be kids. And the camp lets them do that, and I think that we captured that in that picture, which is good. It's because actually it was their idea to do the bunny ears. I told them, you know, stand next to each other, put your arms around each other. I don't know if everybody remembers Old Mills, the old photographs that Old Mills did. We started with an Old Mills picture. And that was, and I know when I'm behind the camera, it's not working. It doesn't look good. So then, and they knew that too, because they were getting tired of doing that. And so then, I don't remember which of the girls did it first, but I don't know if you remember which, which of you did the bunny ears first. But as soon as I saw the bunny ears go up, I was like, that's awesome. Both of you do the bunny ears. And then they kind of ran with it and did it. And we got the perfect picture, which was good. So that was kind of my experience of capturing the photographs for the portraits. So I think the whole experience for me, at first, I was really nervous about doing the portraits and everything because of the initial information I got about what the camp is and what they deal with and everything, I was really nervous about, like I said, overthinking about showing the aspect of the illness part. And then once I threw that out the window and realized it was just about doing the pictures of the kids having fun, it made it really easy for me. And then especially once I got there, the kids made it really easy for me because they were having so much fun, it was easy to capture that on camera and then translate that into the paintings. So I mean, I was really happy with the process because I didn't have to work very hard. <laughs> they made it easy on me, which was good. But I was, I was really happy that we got to do, the visits and everything were amazing, and once we got into the research of what was going into the camp and how they do everything that they do, I couldn't believe that I, one, that I hadn't heard of it before then, which I felt terrible about. And then after seeing everything, it's just really amazing like the opportunity that they give the kids. Because I went to summer camp, I think one summer when I was younger, I think I went one summer, it might have been two. But um, I went to a summer camp through Cub Scouts, I think it was. And our summer camp was nowhere near as awesome as Flying Horse Farms. <laughs> we played soccer in the snow. That was the highlight of the summer camp that I remember. And I think we learned how to build a fire. And those were the two things that I remember. We didn't have an obstacle course. We didn't have a fishing pond. We didn't have all these things that these kids have at this Flying Horse Farms. So I was really happy to see, because I didn't know what to expect when we visited, and just blown away by the things that they have up there. So very, very good experience. I think it shows just the, the positivity all the way through. You know, when starting from something that I was really nervous and unsure about to get to there, it was, just, it was really good. It's really, really good. So thanks for listening to me. Thank you. <laughs> we are so fortunate as a gathering to represent Karen and Mark. And they're just one of the 17 who had that kind of enthusiasm in doing this project. I neglected to mention that Mark has shown at the National Portrait Gallery in London. So he has quite a, a bit of reading And you can see the wonderful pictures of his children. 
And I have another artist who also participated, Joe Stewart. And she went to uh, Flying Horse and she participated. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret.